Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We are so glad. Can't even tell you how. I don't even have the words to describe how glad I am you're here today. And I'm more happy and more excited that Jesus is here. That's right. <clears throat> Jesus told Peter, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, it wasn't upon Peter. No matter what you say, he wasn't the first pope. I'm sorry. If he was, things are really messed up because he was married. Okay? But he was talking about upon this rock, upon the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Upon the faith and understanding that we have that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. The faith that he is still living. He's still alive. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is here. He's in this place. I'm going to let Pastor Mike preach, not me. Come on and stand, please, if you would. And let's just worship the Lord upon this rock. He is our rock. Praise God. Salvation that cannot be moved. He's proven himself to be faithful and 
Isn't he good today? Isn't he good? Before you're seated today, would you join me in the reading of our church mission statement? It says, to be transformed by Jesus and to lead our community to him. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Uh, I do want to remind everybody that uh, we've been talking about our alabaster uh, offering now for several weeks, and next week is it. After next week, you won't hear about it for a long time. So uh, make sure you remember next week to bring your uh, little boxes in, or if you'd rather just write a check, that's fine. Just make it out to the Church of the, of the New Beginning Church, and uh, we'll make sure it gets put to good use. And all the uses are listed in your bulletin here. Just read through that. You'll see how, what a wonderful work uh, that our denomination does through the Alabaster Program. So God bless you. Any other announcements that we want to make? No? Good. All right, well, let's stand and welcome one another to our church today. All right, would everyone please uh, return to your seating area, but remain standing. We're going to continue in worship now.
together. Father, this morning as we've come into this sanctuary, it has been our desire to experience you in a very real and maybe even in a very unusual way. We have thought of, as we have sang together about who you are. And Lord, we think, is, we think of Isaiah, who's seen you high and lifted up. May we this morning see you high and lifted up. <laughs> Father, could you in these moments transport us into your heavenly sanctuary. That we may experience you, and Father, in a way that we will experience you throughout eternity. And Father, may this sanctuary be transformed this morning into your sanctuary. And may each and every one of us meet with you in a way that, um, that we desperately need. May we hear this morning your words. May we experience this morning your arms as they wrap around us and, and they hold us up. May we know what it means this morning to be your children 
And may we be encouraged by that truth. There are those that have come today, Father, maybe, maybe they're hurting, maybe they're sick. God, we know you are the God of comfort, the God of all comfort, your word proclaims. And we seek that comfort, we seek that healing touch for those today uh, that need it. You are uh, the God of decision, direction, and purpose. And may you direct our path. May you show us the way, that, Lord, that you desire for our lives. And, and for those that have come into the sanctuary of prayer this morning, maybe undecided, maybe looking for direction. May we know the direction that you are taking us, and, and may we accept it, Father, with rest and with peace and with full trust, knowing that, that you know, you know best. We always pray, Father, that there would be those that would be, even among us this morning, there may be one individual that has come in that doesn't really know you. They know who you are, but they don't know you. May this be the day that they enter into a relationship with you, that they, they, they get to know you in a very personal and real way. May this be the day. Father, we pray your blessing and your favor upon, uh, upon the church uh, this morning. Would you, just, would you just pour yourself out upon us as we pour ourselves into you? We love you, Lord Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Ushers, uh, would you come now? I, they will be wait upon you for your tithes and offerings.
Well, I, I just I, I continue to uh, enjoy uh, the presence of the Lord here in this place. I continue to enjoy uh, your presence. It is, uh, it is a joy. It's exciting uh, for me to get up on Sunday morning and come here. Um, I'm grateful to, uh, grateful to be here and grateful to share with you uh, what God is saying through his word. Again, this morning, we're going to be in the Gospel of John. And, uh, and this morning, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, if you'd open uh, to uh, the 14th chapter of John, John 14, that's a very familiar passage uh, to most of you uh, in the room. It's uh, a passage that I have read uh, many, many times, and uh, sometimes in uh, very encouraging settings and sometimes in very difficult moments, I've uh, gone through this particular conversation. John chapter 14. Again, I'm going to ask you this morning to kind of put on your, uh, your imagination caps here and kind of like come with me to a place. A few weeks ago when we began together, we had, uh, we had began uh, in this, uh, this very moment in the life of Jesus and his disciples as he uh, shared with them a meal together. And after the meal, uh, he got up from uh, the table and it was there that he washed the feet of the disciples. Following that particular event, he continues to have a conversation with them, and, and the conversation that he is having with them, I just, I need us, I need me, I need you, I need us to understand that this was the last opportunity that Jesus would really have before he would go to the cross and be crucified to talk to his disciples. And so he, he, was, uh, he was preparing them for uh, some very difficult times in their life. Uh, even though that he had talked about this uh, for the three and a half years that they had walked with him, I do not believe from what I have studied and what I have read, it truly sank in. Uh, they continually can have their own ideas of what, uh, what God's kingdom would look like, what Messiah would look like, what the kingdom would look like. And, and Jesus had tried to explain to them that, uh, that he would have to go to the cross, he would have to die, and he would have to be resurrected from the grave to fulfill God's plan for them and for himself. Uh, and it, this, was about to, this was about to happen. This was the moment after three and a half years of being together, after eating together, after uh, journeying together, uh, it was about upon them that uh, he, would be, uh, he would be taken from them. And so their world literally would be turned upside down. And I know that in this room, that many of us, we make plans and we, we think things are going to work the way they're going to work. And something in life comes along and turns our world upside down. Am I right? Am I right this morning? Does that not happen? It happens to me. It happens to you. If, you, if it's never happened to you, I promise you, I'm sorry, it will. Um, this is just the way, life, the way life is. I mean, we, uh, we have our plans. We think we know what we're doing. We think we know where we're going. We think we know how things are going to work out. And um, something comes along and changes those plans. And uh, Jesus is preparing his disciples for a major change in their life. And he opens this conversation with them. And these are, this is in, in, uh, in, in red letters, so we know it is the words of Jesus. He says to them, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't you love that? I mean, how many of you this morning, you need to hear that? I mean, I know I need to hear that this morning. And this morning as I got up and I opened this up before I came over again and I read it again, I needed to hear, do not let your heart be troubled. Uh, and, and, and in essence, he goes on to say that uh, we are to believe in God. Believe also in me. Now, often we, we look at that word believe and um, it really doesn't take on the, the strength that uh, it's really intended for in the conversation that Jesus is having. You know, we can believe in something and yet not believe in it. You know, not true. We can, we can believe that, you know, that uh, uh, that chair exists. But when you sit in it, you believe in it. Right? And so he's talking about more than just believing in something that exists. He's talking about trusting in. Putting your, your full trust in. So he's saying, do not let your heart be troubled. In essence, he's saying, trust in me. Trust in God, trust in me. Now that, again, that does, um, uh, that's uh, so difficult 
uh, for us because it, 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 it means that we are to fully, in this context, we are to fully surrender ourselves to another and to trust them completely. And you, you'll say, well, you know, uh, Pastor, I've been coming to church for years, and, and I, know, I know how that works. I know how to do that. And uh, the truth is we don't always do that. And, and I know that because what we do is we try to often work things out on our own. We try to manipulate instead of just falling into, just falling into God and saying, okay, God, I, I, I get it. I have no control over this, but I'm going to give you complete control. I'm going, I'm going, to, I'm going to trust you completely. And, and that, that is the kind of life that these individuals were being called upon to live. And honestly, they were still learning. And they would continue to learn even after the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Even after they were filled with the Spirit, they would continue to learn what this means. They would not become, in essence, super Christians. There would be times that they would, they would fail in their trust in God. We all do it. We need to be reminded. And he reminds them here and he reminds us through these words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You, you believe in God. Believe also in me. And then he goes on to, to talk about uh, one, of the, one of the great passages uh, that we, we, we've read over and over again. He said, my father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may know where I'm going. Now, that's, that's pretty encouraging that our God is preparing a place for us in his kingdom. I mean, and, and i got to tell you something this morning. He's got room for everybody. Sadly, there'll probably be a lot of vacancies. But every individual that was ever born into this world, God has made a place. And it is his desire that, that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance, that all should know him, that all should be a part of his eternal kingdom. And I know we believe that. Because that's who we are as kingdom people. That's why we go out and we share the good news. Because we want nobody to be lost. Jesus is making a statement here to them, and he's about to undergo his own death. Listen. I'm preparing a place for you. I will come and I will, I will come back and I will get you. Now, I think he's saying two things here. I want you to understand. I think, I think it's, there's a twofold message here because some of these individuals are going to pass away before the second coming. I mean, it's just going to happen. We know that. We, we know that it's been thousands of years ago. And I think he's saying to them that, that, that on the day that, uh, the day that we take our last breath, I'm going to come and I'm going to get you. I'm going to receive you to myself. I don't know how many times I've stood in the room with kingdom people and, and I've seen the peace that passes all understanding in those moments because they know, they know, they know that Jesus is coming into the room and he's taking them to be with him forevermore into eternal life. But I also believe that the passage is saying that someday, someday that uh, our Lord is going to come back. And he's going he's to receive his bride. And he's going to make all things right. And so those words, uh, those words are encouraging to us. Now, that's not what I came to preach about this morning. But I wanted you to hear that as we get into this, this conversation. Thomas, we know him as Doubting Thomas, said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And then Jesus answered, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way into the eternal kingdom. And it is through Jesus Christ. And if we know anything about the Gospel of John, if we studied anything in the Gospel of John, it's, it's, it's absolutely my favorite gospel, absolutely my favorite book of the entire Bible. I love, I love John. I love John as, as a writer. But there's, there's, there's a point that, that John tries to drive home to his listeners. That Jesus is God. That Jesus is the Messiah. I mean, he opens up the gospel with that in mind. And the continual theme all through the gospel itself is reminding us of who Jesus is. There's only one way. 
into the eternal kingdom. There's only one way to have our sins forgiven. There's only one way to know God, and it's through Jesus, who is God. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And then Jesus goes on to say this, and this is something like, like I think I get stuck sometimes on passages like, you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, because they're so good. But I, I, I fail to see what's coming after. And, and, and I'm reading it again this week, and, and all of a sudden it's like, how did I miss that? He said, now, listen to the way he re- says this to, to Thomas. If you really know me, not new, if you really know me, anyway, Thomas, if you really know me, I mean, I think in a moment like this, maybe put our own name. Do we really know him? There's a, there's a truth I try to live into, and I, I fail often. But our God is the Emmanuel, which means he is the God who is with us, which means he is in this room this morning, which means as we leave here this morning, he goes with us. And, and, and we live in this, this living presence of God in his spirit. He doesn't, he doesn't sit in his heavenly kingdom and wait on us to show up next Sunday. But he's with us all the time. And sometimes we, we, go, we, go, we, we just go into life, and we live life, and, and, and we deal with all the things that, that are thrown at us, and we deal with them without this living God that's among us. Because sometimes I, I think we, we, we really don't know him the way he wants to be known. I mean, we know about him, I mean, we read the stories. I mean, many of us are seasoned in the Word. We've been in the Word for a long time, and we've been to Sunday school, and we've been to church, and we've heard revivals, and, but do we know Him? Do we know Him like we know our spouses, our children? Are we saying this morning, He knows us? Oh, my, does He know us. He knows everything about us. And yet he chooses to love us so incredibly. Well, he says to Thomas, he said, uh, you will know my father as well. And from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. And so again, he was was reminding Thomas of who he was. I mean, it's so hard for us to understand. Imagine these individuals God had put on flesh and came into the world that he created and chose to live as a human. Not just to save us, to live in his eternal kingdom. But as I was reminded this week, to show us how to live right now. Every day. I mean, we are on a journey. And sometimes we kind of forget about from the birth to the grave. And we're only thinking eternal kingdom. But while we're on that journey, we're eternal people. We are, we're his children. And and, and we are to live as, 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 as he teaches us to live. And that's, only the way he teaches us, but he, he shows us how to live. And Thomas had been a firsthand witness of this, and Jesus says, come on, Thomas. And I don't think he was just talking to Thomas, but I think, you know, Peter and James and, and John and, and Andrew and Bartholomew and, and Matthew and, and, uh, and, and Thaddeus, all those, they were listening in on the conversation, and he was, he was saying to them, hey, listen, have you been with me so long, you, you really don't know who I am? You're really not getting it? And then what I did come to share with you this morning was Thomas's response.
And Philip said this. He said, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. I kind of landed in that, in that statement. And I landed in on the word enough. Because it, it seems like that we are a people that can never get enough. We, we live in a world of, of consumerism. The idol of today. I snuck a peek at my, one of my wife's devotions this weekend. and was talking about idols. And I thought, you know, one of the greatest idols, well, I believe probably the greatest idol of the culture that we live in today is, is consumerism. We've got to have more. We can, we can never have enough. I've known individuals who, who have been blessed with great wealth, and it's never enough. In fact, I've known individuals that have been blessed with great wealth that, that, that hoard that wealth. They, they live such miserable lives because they want more, and they want more, and they want more. But I also know individuals that God has blessed with great wealth, and they continue to give it away, and God just keeps giving them more. They can't get rid of it. It just keeps coming back. And those individuals seem to be individuals that got it, wasn't theirs to keep. I lived in a world, before I became a Christian, I lived in a world of strong men and women. I lived in a world where strength was the desire of the people that I lived with and hung with. And they would do anything to be strong. And it seemed like the stronger they got, it just wasn't enough. They would take stuff, they would do things to be stronger and stronger and stronger. Not enough. <laughs> One of the things that we, we, we all struggle with, I know I struggle with, there's never enough time Man, I struggle with not having enough time. There's only 24 hours in a day. I just can't get it all accomplished. A friend of mine quoted something to me. I probably won't get it right. It may help us with this idea of not having enough time. Our God will not give us more to do than we can accomplish in a day. Anything other than what we have not accomplished, maybe it was not God's will for our life in the first place, is what he was saying. Enough. But then back, back to the passage itself, you know, Thomas said, Lord, uh, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. I mean, just, just, show, just, just show us one more miracle. I mean, come on. I mean, miracle after miracle, these individuals had been witness to. Listen, I know that they heard the words of heaven because this writer recorded them. And this writer writes as an eyewitness. He was there when John baptized Jesus. Jesus came up out of the water, and it appeared as though a dove had landed upon him. And the words from heaven, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. Show us the Father. That'll be enough. They were there when he turned the water into wine. That first miracle that, that Jesus had participated in. The blind would see. Lepers would be healed. Lame would walk. Those who could not hear would hear. The dead would raise from the grave. But if you'll show us one more miracle, show us the Father, that'll be enough. We'll believe then. And honestly, I could be so critical of these guys. I can't be. I can, I think sometimes 
What's the matter with you guys? Are you not getting it? I mean, I read, I read their story over and over again, but then I think about, I was, I was sharing this week with, uh, with my daughters. Often we, we talk, uh, she's a pastor at one of our churches here in the district, and, and we talk sometimes of what we're preaching about and what we're working through. And, and I was, you know, I, I read this statement to her, and uh, I was talking about the whole idea of just show us one more miracle, and that'll be enough. And then I realized it's, it's human nature. Because if you go back to what they were celebrating... They were celebrating Passover. I mean, that's, that's what they were, they were, they were telling, they were telling God's story. Because that's what they did at Passover. They, they told God's story. They, they talked about the miracles that God would do among their people while they were in slavery in Egypt. That's what's happening. And if you go back and you'll read the story, you will notice that every time that God would do something miraculous in the life of his children it would not be long before they would forget. Well, I never forget. I'm going to tell you a personal story here. I never forget. We, we adopted, uh, unofficially, we adopted a young lady who was our daughter, and uh, she has given us three beautiful grandchildren. And uh, she came into our home uh, out of high school. She was living in a pretty difficult situation. And my daughter brought her home and said she can't go back. And so she moved in with us. And, and she became a part of our family. She is our, our daughter. And uh, we, have, we have raised her up. And uh, through the process of her living with us, she started going to church with us. And uh, through, the, through the watching of the, the passion, which I do not recommend that if you're a non-believer and you watch that like late at night because she like, suffered miserably through the night because she watched that, she gave her heart to Christ. Now, you've got to understand Courtney. Now, Courtney may listen to this a little bit later on, and, and she knows that I owe money to my kids when I talk about them in a, in a sermon. And so I may have to give her some money a little bit later on today because I've used her name. I'm going to be careful how many times I use it. Um, she is, uh, of all of, of, all of our, our kids, she is very, very detailed, very uh, analytical. I mean, she started reading the Bible. She said, Dad, I'm going to start reading the Bible. I would recommend if you start reading the Bible for the very first time, you start in the Gospel of John. She started in Genesis. Because she's going to read it from the beginning, and she's going to read it all the way through, and she gets into the book of Exodus. And then she gets mad. And she calls me. She said, Kim, I need to talk to you. I don't understand these people. That was the conversation. I never forget. I don't understand these people. Look at everything that God is doing for them, and they're not very appreciative. They keep forgetting. And this seems to be the story, the ongoing story throughout God's story and the word that he has left us. God does amazing things to bring his people back to him, and then we easily forget. Don't we? Especially when things are going really good. Like, things are going really good in our life. All right, God, you know what? I'll come back. I'll visit with you as soon as things get rough again. As soon as I need you. Do not believe with all my heart, and I know you do not believe this, that that's the way our God meant us to live with him. It is a very intimate special relationship that our God has designed for us with him. I mean, he's telling Thomas, listen, I mean, if you go on and you read the rest of, the, rest of the, uh, the conversation, he's telling Thomas, don't you know who I am? You've been with me. You've seen this. Everything that I'm doing. I'm not only your Messiah, but I'm your God who chose to come and be a part of, of your life. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the rest of this, and I'm going to leave you with a very, very simple, I'm going to try to leave you with a very, very simple um, statement here this morning. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for so long, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. 
How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but rather it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe in me when I say, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name that the Father may be glorified in the Son and that you may ask me anything in my name and I will do it. Don't get incredibly excited about this statement. Please don't take it out of context. There are those that have. Those, there are those who have simply proclaimed the name of Jesus and said, this is what I want. Now go ahead and do it. They're naming it. They're claiming it. It's going to happen. That's, I've heard that kind of preaching. Not only have I heard that kind of preaching, individuals have told me that's what that scripture means. Jesus was saying, listen, as we get into this story, Jesus was saying, watch me. When you see me, you've seen the Father. When you see the Father, you've seen me. We, we, are, we are in concert. We are, we are moving together. We have the, the same mind, the same purpose. We're going the same direction. You, you can't tell us apart because we are. Then he, he calls upon us, uh, uh, his, his children, as he lives in us for us to live in him. And so when we read a passage like this and we take it out of context, it's very dangerous. I believe what this is saying is that when we live in the center of God's will, God will accomplish his purpose. When we live in the center of God's will, he will accomplish his purpose. And, and, and church, it's not our will. It's not what we desire. Well, I have difficulty with that sometimes. I plan my life, and it's like, okay, that's not what I had planned. God interrupts and says this, but I got a better plan. I want to say this very clear this morning. I want, I, want, I want this to help us. To, I want this to help me. I want this to help you. To live the way that our God intended us to live. We cannot put conditions on what he wants to do in our life. We can't say, God, if you will do this, I will do that. I mean, I want to. I want to say, God, if you'll just do this, I'll go ahead and I'll do this. I'll ser- you know, you've heard people say, well, God, if you do this for me, I'll serve you the rest of my life. If you just do one more miracle, I'll do this, I'll do this for you, God. I believe that when we do that, we're out of line with the will of God. I believe, I mean, it's, it's so difficult for us. It should be, God, I'm going to trust you so much, so completely, that regardless of what you do, I'm going to love you. I'm going to be obedient to you. I'm going to follow you. That's, that's, the, way, that's the way God wants us to come to him. It's fully trusting children, realizing who he is. Not saying to him, God, if you just show me one more miracle, I'll get saved. If you just show me one more miracle, I'll get sanctified. God, if you just show me one more miracle, I'll go preach your word. God, if you just show me one more miracle, I'll go into the mission field. God, I'll just, whatever God, whatever God you want from me, I know you love me and I love you. And whatever it is, regardless of what what I want or what you're going to do back. 
I trust you. 